Dungeons and Dragons, and it's advanced. Today we're talking about how to win at RPGs, and we're going to be using this, the OG, original, tabletop RPG in its purest and most complete form. The game's so nice, they've made it, well not just thrice, but like six times now I think, Never to be equal, these three books right here. And I want to show you why, because if you follow these rules and you put together a campaign using these rules, you will have an amazing experience. A lot of the problems that people have with their RPGs today arise because they've gotten away from this. They've neglected, they've carved out rules, and it has created big problems that, that's great for the grifters. Because they are more than happy to sell you shelves and shelves and shelves of advice. How to fix the problems caused because you're not playing the game. They will produce tons of videos fixing the problems caused because you're not playing the game. Today I'm here to tell you that the way to win at RPGs is to play the game. But it takes a little bit more than that because in order to win at RPGs, you have to fix not just your game, but you have to fix, look in the mirror, bub, you gotta fix yourself. The big problem that modern tabletop RPGs have is the selfishness inherent in the style of play. Modern RPGs are not group activities. They are individual activities that you participate in as a group. Just think about the contrast between combat in this version of D&D and combat in, I think, just about all of them that follow. Combat in modern D&D is... Everybody is very special. They're the center of their own universe. And when it's your turn to shine, everything comes to a halt because it's all about you. I need to look at my character sheet and I need to count squares to see where I move and look at my options. And everybody, hold on. It's going to take me a few minutes to get through this. Okay, I'm done. And then you pass the hot potato and it's somebody else's turn to be the center of the universe. They call that spotlight time. And the nearest thing anybody has come up with for... A solution to the problem of being bored for 20 minutes until your turn comes up is just ensure that the spotlight gets shared. Everybody gets a turn to be selfish. And I'm here to tell you, if you want to fix your RPGs, you've got to turn that upside down and you've got to be more generous with your time and your focus. You've got to put the rules first because if you put these rules first then the campaign will naturally flow from that. And when the campaign naturally flows from that, you'll be able to introduce characters that you will view as not quite as dispassionately as, say, a, a knight on a chessboard, but close enough, because you're more interested in making the campaign excellent than you are your one little slice of fragile ego. Everybody is working to the same goal. Everybody is pulling on the same rope in the same direction. That is the whole point of how to win at RPGs. We are now 13 or maybe 14 episodes in, and the common refrain throughout all of these videos is, be more generous. If you can do that, then your game is going to excel. Don't listen to the guys who take one of my videos. There have been a couple of videos produced by large D&D-focused channels, and they tried to take a stab at one-to-one -one time, but that's just one aspect of the greater campaign. They kind of botched it because they weren't looking at the total package. Don't worry. I'm sure in the next six months, they'll figure out a way on their own completely independently to present the same information that I'm presenting to you now. Congratulations, viewer. You are six months ahead of the curve of the rest of D&D because you're watching this video that's going to take all 12 to 14 of those those videos that we talked about before, and we're going to put it together into a seamless whole, and we're going to teach you how to make the best D&D campaign you've ever had. And the way you're going to do that is by turning the clock back to Chainmail. To be fair, but before we get to that, to be fair, I'm not the first guy to invent this, right? The guys that I learned this from, they're over on Twitter as the Bro SR. They're not the first to do that. But nobody told them this. They had to discover it for their own. Through, ye through years of dedicated play and hard work and investigation. I am the least of them. I am merely their herald. Proper credit where credit is due. Unlike some other YouTube channels. 
Guys like Jeffro Johnson, there's a fellow uh, named B-Dubs, uh, Chanticleer, I think he changed his name, but these are the, some of the giants. Guy named Kersova is excellent at it. Vince McMaximus, you've heard these names before. These guys did the heavy lifting and showed me what you could accomplish if you just read the manuals and played the game that Gary Gygax described. Okay, And I'm going to help you understand how to do that, right? And at its simplest, it's just read the manuals, play the game. But two mindset shifts need to happen, right? The first one is be more generous. Think about the campaign first. Put yourself second. And ironically enough, you will come out ahead. It's not to say this is not competitive. The kind of competitiveness that you are participating in is the kind of competitiveness that you see in a symphony where the two guys playing violin are pushing each other to greatness. They both want to be first chair. And every time one of them gets a little better, it pulls the other one up. And then they're both playing better. And then the symphony gets better. They're two boxers or MMA fighters who are constantly working on the craft. And they're fighting each other over and over. And they just keep getting a little bit better and a little bit better, right? Competition makes you better. We're going to do that, but we're going to do the competition within the confines of this campaign. So how do you set that up? How do you actually do it? That's all really good. That's all light and airy fairy. Oh, be a good person. How do you actually do that? That's the challenge. All right. Well, the mindset shift that you need to go through here, and you know, one more little caveat, nothing that I'm telling you here hasn't been done by other people in the past. When we talk about things like patrons and factions, don't get lost in the you know forest for the trees. Yes, some games use the terms patrons for NPCs that will hire people, right? Some people use factions. Oh, yeah, there's faction play. I've been using faction play forever. This thing that I've been talking about for a year that nobody said could work, suddenly in the last two weeks, they're crawling out of the woodwork saying they've always used it. These are very similar, right? And maybe you've seen slices of this video implemented very well in other RPGs. I doubt you've seen them all integrated into a seamless whole like this. All right, so now I think we're finally ready to talk about how miniature war game campaigns work. I say, hey, guys, I want to, you know, I'm willing to be an umpire for a miniature war game campaign. Who's got an army they want to use? And one guy says, oh, hey, I've got orcs. Okay, fine, you're going to be the orcs. And another guy says, I've got elves. I say, okay, cool. And another guy says, I've got humans. All right, great, no problem. Oh, whoa, whoa. But my friend wants to play, but all he has is orcs. That's not a problem, right? Okay, so right off the bat, I, as the umpire, haven't set anything up. I just ask people, what are we going to throw into the pot? And I've got two orcs, elves, and humans. And I'm pointing like this for a reason, because what I'm really doing here as kind of a case study is I'm describing the chainmail campaign that I'm running even as we speak. Here's our human lands down south. We've got elves in a forest in the center of the map, and then we've got two independent orc uh, countries, let's call it, right? These guys in the grasslands here, these over here. I've got some light woods and some heavy woods that are kind of empty-ish for the moment. And a couple of wild cards in the form of a hydra, a wizard, and a giant. Those may come up. They may not. They're just kind of sitting there minding their own business. You know, much like a, a, a fairly neutral country. As long as they're not disturbed, they're not going to get involved. But they're there if anybody wants to, say, march 100 prisoners up there. Now, this miniature war game campaign works with a referee like this. Everybody will... They'll talk to each other. And I, as the referee, I don't need to be part of that conversation. These two orc players can go off and make whatever plans they want. The elves and the humans can say, yeah, we're totally working together. The humans say, listen, if you guard this flank, my eastern flank, I'll march my army up in the west. All right, just make sure that the orcs don't come down through here. And the elves say, so you don't know, launch your attack this way. And the elves say... Oh, yeah, no problem, buddy. Meanwhile, they're sharpening their knife and they're looking for a good place to stick it in the back of the Bromans. So the Bromans aren't dumb. They're going to run some light patrols just to make sure that the elves live up to their end of the bargain. And when the elvish army comes down here, then I, as the referee, say, hey, uh, Broman, there's an army approaching you. And the Broman says, whoa, 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 I'm going to recall my army. And the elves say, ha, just kidding, bro. I, I, I guess I'm going north after all. Right? So suddenly... I think you understand what's going on here. There's a game that's happening outside of the game. Let me tell you a story about a game called Necromunda. Back in the late 90s, I participated in a Necromunda campaign, and it was a blast. Early on, not so much for me because I played Goliaths and Goliaths stink. I got my bald head handed to me over and over and over. 
what can I say? I finally got so disgusted, I said, look, let me just be the referee, okay? And that opened up some interesting possibilities. We still had the tabletop fights going on. But as the referee, one of the players came up to me and said, hey, Mr. Wargaming, I want my gang to be part of the local like militia. I can't remember what they're called, the, like, the, the watch or whatever they are. I said, okay, fine. Here's what you need to do. You need to capture one specific outlaw, right? This one character. You need to blow up this gambling den over here that one of the other players controlled. There was, I can't remember what the third one was. I think it was like pay me or pay the watch a certain amount of money. So if you could get credits, destroy a gambling den and capture a guy and turn him over, you get to be part of the watch. You don't have to go through the actual rules as written. We've got this game that we're playing away from the table. Those rules for whether you're recruited or not are for, you know, neutral campaigns where you don't have a guy like me that's offering you ways to accomplish things away from the table. Other guys came to me and said, hey, what if I want to poison the leader of that company um, before our next battle? And it turns out, and I didn't realize this at the time until after the campaign had had died a, a slow death, there were guys that were making agreements for you challenge the, you, whoever it was like a, a kingmaker situation, right? Where or king killer, one guy would get so far ahead that these two guys would say, "Look, you attack his gang on Monday. I'll attack his gang on Tuesday. I'll have an easier time of it, but we'll split the proceeds from whatever we take from them." Like they were planning strategies away from me and then implementing them. Now, as the referee, I asked everybody, "Just keep emailing me the results." And I didn't know about all the skullduggery that was going on in the background. That level of play happens in miniature war games like this, and there's no reason that it can't happen in a campaign using this, right? We call that various terms. Brownstein is one of them. The Brownstein was the very first example of this, where a guy named Major David Wesley, he ran a, a, a university. It's kind of a LARP. It was on the border of France and Prussia prior to the outbreak of the Franco-Prussian War. And he told the guys, whatever happens in this game, it's going to affect the miniature war game that we're playing next week. The, the secret was there was no miniature war game. And he didn't realize that the players weren't going to wait for him. If they needed to talk to a guy, they were going to go find that guy. Kind of a proto-LARP and kind of a, an idea for how to implement factions away from the tabletop. Now, if he had actually run a campaign or a miniature battle based on the results of that Brownstein, it would have been fascinating. He didn't quite go that far. That was where Dave Arneson stepped in and said, what if I do that kind of Brownstein and I use that for a more ground level situation? And that's what we're talking about here. That's the value of this new old style of tabletop RPG. So now you've got your five factions, and maybe one of your friends says, oh, you know, I, I don't have a whole lot of time, and I don't have any miniatures. Can I take the wizard, you know, for a faction? And you say, well, yeah, I don't, I don't know what you do. Well, you don't have to know what the wizard's going to do, right? He's, he, you just say, yeah, look, I guess you're a, like, what, a 14th level wizard. But then he can go here to the player's handbook, and he can say, well, let's see what spells a 14th level wizard has. Oh, I've got teleport. I've got clairvoyance. I've got all these things that I can do to sell my services to these guys. I can go to the leader of the bro home and say, hey, do you want to know where this army is? Do you want perfect intel? No problem. And if by no problem, I mean how deep are your pockets, right? So now you can have a guy that doesn't really have any like armed forces that's having a real effect. One of the other guys that did this, one of the other leading lights, and all credit where credit is due, Tony Bath was doing this prior to, to the boys up in Wisconsin. His Hyboria campaign did the same thing. There were players hiring assassins to murder the generals of the other players' forces that were appearing within the campaign itself. I highly recommend this book right here. Tony Bath's Ancient Wargaming. He goes into great detail on how he ran this top-level campaign that had trickle-down effects to the tabletop campaign. Turning our attention once more to the player's handbook. There's no reason, so you've got your miniature war game, and maybe you're not even using miniatures, right? Maybe another guy comes up and he says, and this is where the beauty of this, this perfect mapping between chainmail 
and the next step, the Dungeon Master's Guide, comes in handy because a guy says, hey, I want to run goblins. And you say, oh, you know, I put some goblins here in this this long maze. They were just kind of a blocking force to, like, channel armies where I wanted them to go. But if you want to be a goblin, that's fine. I just, man, I wish I had some rules for balancing those goblin forces. Skadoosh, you've got it right here. Let's take a look at the entry for... The Goblins. Let's see. D, E, F, and G. Spoiler alert. G comes after F. Gnomes. Oh, there's a gnome. Okay, so goblins. So, hey, how many goblins are we going to give this guy, huh? Well, let's see. It says, uh, oh, they're right there. Number appearing 40 to 400. Yeah, you've got a goblin tribe with, let's roll some dice. Oh, look, 320 goblins. Well, but how do we break those down? Well, let's read the entry. For every 40 goblins, there will be a leader and four assistants. Oh, that means we've got eight leaders and 32 assistants that are equal to, they have the same stats, in other words, as orcs. If 200 or more goblins are encountered, check, that's us. There will be a sub-chief and two to eight guards, each fighting as hobgoblins. There's a 25% chance 10% of its strength is mounted on wolves. Ah, that's pretty cool. And if this is the case, there will be from 10 to 40 wolves without riders. Oh, so now we've got a full order of battle. You can go through the whole thing on yourself. Full order of battle. Well, what are they armed with? we got to turn up here to the, the top of the page and say, oh, look, you know, short sword picks, uh, 30% with spear, 20% with morning stars. Uh, oh, and they can mine. Now, in this book, if you read it and you follow it, you will find that the work is parceled out. If you're the referee that's running this campaign, you say to the guy who's got the goblin, you say, look, this is your 30-mile hex. See this part of the woods right here? There's a barrier. There's a line of hills here. Why don't you go ahead and draw up the map for that? Show me where your headquarters is. Modern D&D expects a DM to draw this out, create features, and assign to that player what he's dealing with. This game tells the DM, bro, take it easy. Turn that work over to the goblin player himself. Within reason, let him draw out his own domain. Where is his headquarters? Does he have four campsites that he rotates between? In any given week of the month, he is at one of those four. Does he have a huge ruined pile? A ruined Roman, you know, old Roman Empire castle? The ruins that he's claimed as his own? Has he dug his own dungeon? Let him map out his dungeon. He's doing the work of creation for you. A generous DM helps create a living world. Well, oh, but how fast can these goblins dig? The rules are right in here, guys. Particularly if they've got the goal to hire hobgoblins who dig a lot faster. Maybe they hire some dwarves from, you know, some mountains somewhere else. Who knows? The point is, the rules are right here for adding those factions. And now, if you want to start right here, ability scores. Hey, some friends say I understand you're having a lot of fun with this top-level D&D campaign, but we want to run some low-level characters. We want to roll up some level ones and start exploring some woods. You say, yeah, cool. You know, I, I have some little one-page dungeons that, you know, and I've got some some wandering monster tables, and we can have some fun. We'll just kind of make it up as we go along. I already know what's going on at the top level of this campaign, right? And these characters say, yeah, because you know what we really want to do is we want to carve out a kingdom of our own down here. Okay, great. Go in here, start clearing out some space, maybe over here. Maybe that's how Baron Elizabeth, remember from our campaign, maybe that's how Baron Elizabeth got her start. Maybe she worked her way up from first level. I mean, canonically, she married a wealthy man who died and then ran off with his money. Surprisingly enough, hey, you know, fantasy, real life, right? Fantasy teaches about real life. But the point is, it's very easy to now draw up your first level characters and throw them into the mix. And what's even better is, Remember, we had a wizard down here, uh, I don't know, he's on an island somewhere out there, who wasn't sure what he wanted to do. So we start our characters here in Broholm, and they say, well, what's there to do? And me as the DM, I can say, hmm, you know, well, I check, this wizard down here is looking. He's got recruiters in the four biggest cities, and he's looking for people that can go off into the, the dark corners of the world 
and procure for him the components for his spells. You interested? They say, mm, no, not really. Okay, well, it turns out the head of the church in Broholm is putting together a diplomatic mission that's pursuing peace with the elves that live in the Darkbriar. Would you be willing to run a message from here to here? A lot of people want to keep the divide between the elves and the humans in place because they don't trust elves. For good reason. But the leader of the church says, no, 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 they're cool, bro. We need to make sure that we stay on peaceful terms with them. If you can avoid the king's guard and whoever else can get that message there, there'll be some fat loot in it for you. Maybe free heal spells, whatever. The great part is the wizard, this guy, the, the, the chief of the, 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 the high priest, they're run by players at the top level, right? This priest has been up to all kinds of hanky-panky as he tries to pursue his own diplomatic relations. Uh, maybe there is, maybe again, maybe Baron Elizabeth is recruiting people. Hey, come on up here to the White Hart Woods and help me clear out my hex. And you can rise in her organization until you feel rich enough, strong enough, and powerful enough to make a stab at creating your own barony, either right next door to her, right? This is about 30 miles. There's, there's a hex right there that you can clear. Maybe you clear out this one to act as a buffer state between these two armies. The point is, each of these guys... Baron Elizabeth, the two Orc nations, the elves, they're run by real people who can offer incentives. They've got need for wild cards, for people with a unique set of skills. If you can find them, maybe you can hire, you know, whatever team is, whatever team of goofballs is running these low level adventures. How do we keep everything straight? Well, for starters, you as the DM don't need to. The only time you need to step in is when there's friction among the factions. When these two guys are taking direct action against the elves or against each other. Right? When they say, I'm sending people down into here, what do they find? Then you as the DM have to check your notes. Oh, what did the elves tell me? Or maybe just ask them, hey, tell me what's going on here. I, I can't remember. I lost my notes. Can't remember. And then you can report back. You will have to make judgment calls. That's what umpires do. Really good umpires keep getting hired to umpire games because they're so good at what they do. Notice, however, how much of that load is being shared. The DM doesn't have to create the patrol schedules. He asks for the patrol schedules. And then once he's got them, he can feed the players of the low-level campaign into those patrols. There are some knock-on effects that are not immediately obvious. The patrons, the guys running these factions, who are the most interesting, that have the most interesting jobs to offer, will be the patrons that other players flock to. The patrons who offer something stupid and uninteresting, nobody will pay attention to them. Their ideas will just not get picked up. They won't get spread. They won't get passed around. The reason we talk about the girdle of Vince McMaximus is because the player is hilarious. Because he's got stuff going on. Because he's playing this game at a high level. It gets watered. It gets fed. It grows. It takes on a life of its own. There is a positive feedback loop for interesting ideas that starts to kick in when you implement this style of play. Likewise, there's negative feedback loops. The stuff that's not interesting gets ignored until it just goes away. Almost by magic. And there is a magic. There's a deeper magic there. Okay, how do you keep all that straight? Now, one of the things to bear in mind here is because you've got a lot of different factions with a lot of different power levels, one of the things that you do is you implement the one-to-one -one time. You can't work any faster than the next guy unless you throw a lot more bodies at your problem. You goblins want to build your 10-level your deep dungeon as fast as possible? You're going to have to spend gold to do it because you're only digging at a set rate per day per goblin. If you want to dig faster, you're going to need more goblins. One-to-one -one time serves as a leveling agent for all of these things. Most of the problems that you will come up with through the course of a campaign like this, well, how do I know if the assassin works? The rules are right here. Well, how do I know how big this new faction of... I don't know, let's flip to a random page. Hey, there's a... Uh, there's, there's a there's, what do we got here? Oh, there's Gar in the lake. Here you go. There's there's going to be one to six Gar. That was kind of a bad page. Looks like goblins are pretty popular. What what if I got, uh, what if somebody says they want to run, you know, what, what, there's owlbears, right? Oh, our nemesis, owlbears. 
Everything you need is right here. What if my players run out of interesting things to do? Send them off in the wilderness. But I don't know what's there. You don't have to know what's there. That's what these are for. Random encounter tables. These will help populate this map. The game practically runs itself if you let it. If you just let go of the reins, turn them over to your players, turn them over to Gary. Learn how to trust other people, guys. All right? You, you, you got to get right with yourself. You got to be generous and you got to learn to trust other people. I know you've got a great plan for your campaign. I know you've got a wonderful story in your, in mind. Just write it down, hand it out to us. Okay. Because all of us are smarter than any of us. And if everybody comes to the table and throws their own little ingredient into the soup, it's a stone soup campaign. That's the other metaphor that people have come up with on a regular basis. We all throw our own little ingredients in, and the ones that taste great, people will keep coming back and coming back and coming back to that. Okay? That's the integration for all of these things. One-to-one -one time, faction play, patrons. Pick your alignment to align with one of these factions. How you use assassins and spying. Assassinating people with your assassins is the worst thing you can do. They're information sources. Build a spy network so you know what's going on on the opposite side of the map. How successful they are is right here. And eventually, you can build... You, and the other key lesson here is... Let's go back to the player's handbook here. Let's look at name level for some of these. I don't have them all memorized. All right, let's look at what do we got. Rangers. All right, here, look. They become a ranger at level eight. Well, okay, but, but how do I balance, right? When your guys finally do, after a year or two of adventuring, make it to ranger level, everything that happens to them is spelled out right here. At eighth level, they gain druidic... Wait, where is it? They have a, a, a specials here. Um, let's see if we can focus it a little bit better. Oh, they don't attract the battle rangers. I picked the best one. They just use the regular fighter. Okay, um, so we'll go back to uh, fighter table. Here we go. At name level, when they become, here we go, at third level, that's Paladin again, the fighter. Uh, ninth level, they opt to establish a freehold, build some type of castle, clear the area 20 to 50 miles around it, making it free. Automatically attract a body of men-at-arms led by an above-average fighter. Collect a monthly revenue of seven silver for each and every inhabitant. Uh, let's see, these men will serve as mercenaries so long as they uh, get paid. Um, oh, I guess that's about it. Some of these guys are a lot more interesting than that, though. Like clerics, you know, when they reach 7th level, they will... Oh, it's 8th level, right? Uh, they will attract followers if you establish a place of worship. you got to find that gold. Hey, that's one of the positive feedback cycles. If you want to build that temple for your, for your god, you're going to need cold hard cash. Now you've got an incentive to go out and start poking in the hole for holes in the ground so you can build that temple so you can attract the followers so those followers will start paying you money so you can make more gold to build a bigger temple to attract more followers, right? And you've got built-in incentives when you just read the manuals and play the game. That's how you win at RPGs. I hope this helped. Remember, you heard it here first. This goes at the top. Adopt a more war game approach to your tabletop RPGs and the campaign will generate itself spontaneously and run itself practically on its own. You will be kept busy trying to manage the information flowing at you rather than trying to constantly invent new storylines and new hoops for your players to jump through. Your players will be creating their own hoops to jump through. That's how you win at RPGs. Until next time, I'm praying for you.